Ladies and gentlemen, warm welcome, and thank you for joining us in this installment of the ASNIC interview series. My name is Faraz Al-Badarin. I'm a multimodality cardiac imager at Clinic Clinic Abu Dhabi, and I'm the head of the imaging working group of Emirates Cardiac Society. Joins me tonight is my co-moderator, Dr. Bruno Lima from Boston. Bruno? Hi, hello everyone. I'm Bruno Lima. I'm one of the advanced uh, imaging fellows here at the Brigham. I'm, called, I'm here from Boston. Tonight, we will discuss a very exciting topic that has garnered increasing attention recently, which is the role of myocardial viability testing in contemporary cardiovascular practice, where we will shed light on recent controversies stemming from published randomized clinical trials. To discuss this exciting topic, we're very fortunate to have a distinguished educator and accomplished researcher to guide us uh, in, in this discussion. And we have no one other than Dr. Marcello Di Carli from the Brigham and Women. Marcello? Um, hello, Firas and Bruno. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm excited to be here. Uh, my name is Marcello Di Carli. I, I'm a cardiologist and, and a nuclear cardiologist, although I direct a multimodality imaging at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And so I like all the modalities. I'm a you know, this topic is a favorite of mine. Uh, that's how I started my research career many, many years ago. And so it's uh, deep and dear to my heart. So excited. Excellent. To be here. Ex excellent. So without without further, to, further ado, we're going to jump right into it. And I'm going to ask uh, Marcelo to um, help us understand and set the stage for this discussion and help us understand the concept of hibernation and myocardial viability as it pertains to coronary vascularization. All right. So, uh, so I think, uh, you know, just to put things in context, uh, you know, when we face a patient with heart failure and severe left ventricular dysfunction, uh, obviously, we know that cardiac function is poor. This is why the patient is being investigated for a potential option for revascularization. And so the task for us in imaging is to try to differentiate a dysfunctional myocardium that retains viability from dysfunctional myocardium that is essentially reflective of myocardial scarring uh, and, and essentially no potential for improvement, both functionally and prognostically from revascularization. So the concept uh, you know, of viability in hibernating myocardium and stunned myocardium had been coined many, many years ago and hibernation is defined as myocardium that is dysfunctional, but uh, viable. Uh, and typically, it, uh, it is myocardium that is hypoperfused, and this is why it is dysfunctional, but it retains metabolic activity, indicating the presence of still viable myocytes in that area. Stun myocardium is related to myocardial hibernation. And many believe that stunning is perhaps an earlier stage in the natural history of hibernating myocardium. So we start off with a coronary stenosis that initially uh, will produce stress-induced ischemia followed by stunning. Stunning can be repetitive over time but eventually, as the disease progresses and the lesion becomes critical, then eventually you lose the ability to maintain resting perfusion. And at that point, uh, autoregulation is exhausted. And, and so essentially, flow at rest falls. And at that point, we sort of make that transition to what is being coined as hibernation. Is, is, a, is again, hypoperfused myocardium that is dysfunctional, but is still uh, able uh, to, uh, that is, uh, uh, remains viable. Uh, and, and this is sort of the big task that we have distinguishing between these forms of 
uh, tissue viability from, uh, you know, uh, clearly um, uh, clear myocardial infarction with scar tissue um, formation that essentially has no potential for recovery of function. Uh, so I think those are that's the primary task. As we get on with our conversation, you know, the task is not as easy as one might think, and because there are other things that play into this prediction of benefit from revascularization that we can discuss as as we uh, progress in our conversation. Yeah, fantastic, Marcelo. Um, and <clears throat> considering you know all of the modalities you know that you have, uh, you know, have patch, we have CMR. Uh, as being like, you know, the most widely used modalities, you know, in taking into account, uh, you know, as an mission of uh, patient-centered approach, you know, for this, um, like the right test, you know, for the right patient. So how can we choose the best modality? How do these modalities uh, compare in terms of assessing this, the extent of hibernating myocardium and uh, in guiding the decisions for revascularization? Uh, thank you for that, Bruno. Uh, you know, I think um, when you actually look at the literature, um, all the modalities have something to contribute and all have strengths and weaknesses. Um, you know, uh, you mentioned PET and MRI. And I think uh, in many places, we still use SPECT imaging and we still use the butamine echocardiography in, in places. So when you look at the, uh, the, the strengths and weaknesses, I think you need to remember uh, first, what is the biology of what we're trying to detect? And, um, you know, radionuclide methods uh, characterized by injecting a molecule that will be uh, taken up and, and trapped in the myocyte. And so all you need is a viable myocyte and a membrane, and a membrane to be able to retain the tracer. What you cannot tell is what is the underlying state of that tissue, you know? And, and let me just explain what I mean. Um, it's been shown many, many years ago that hibernating myocardium is not a uniform uh, sort of uh, structural and functionally, uh, you know, myocardium. And, and people have shown that there are stages of hibernating myocardium that go from tissue that retains the normal contractile elements, the sarcomeres, have, you know, normal architecture, and you have other forms of hibernation as you move along the natural history of the disease that have lost most of the contractile elements. And when you look under the uh, uh, um, electron microscope, you see that there is a derangement of all the contractile filaments and so the, the cell is technically viable, right? Because it still has a membrane, has not lost the membrane, but there is nothing there to recover because most of the contractile elements have been lost and the cell is approaching the time of death, right? Now, if you think about radionuclide methods, you will inject a tracer and the tracer will be trapped Mm -hmm. and will be retained. You inject FDG, for example, and you will see FDG uptake. But you cannot tell whether you are at the early stages of the natural history or you are at the later stages of the natural history. And that, of mm -hmm. course, has tremendous implications if you hope to recover ventricular function. Because if you are at the earlier stages with preserved contractile elements, the outcomes are generally better than the outcomes in the later part. So this why this is this explains why radionuclide methods in general are sensitive, right? Because you know we can get the molecule inside the cell, but they're less specific when we 
define specificity as the ability to recover function, which we can discuss whether or not that's the right outcome. And it seems like it is one outcome, but it's not perhaps the principle. But just to show you the weaknesses or relative weaknesses of the method. On the other hand, when you use a method that uses contractile reserve as the main feature for defining whether a cell is viable, for example, dobutamine echo or dobutamine MRI, you will be probing specifically the ability of the cell to respond to that inotropic stimulation. And because you do that, the cell has to retain the contractile elements, right? And so you will be able to be more specific in identifying the myocardium that is still able to respond somehow uh, to a, a, you know, uh, a stimulation. And, and if you revascularize, perhaps it's more likely to improve versus uh, myocardium that doesn't have contractile reserve, which is more towards sort of the latter part of the natural history. And then you have MRI that can provide you an indirect assessment of viability because MRI tells you what's scar tissue, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so you look at LGE, and I think it's a great concept, is basically one minus the amount of LGE is what's viable, right? Myocardium that doesn't enhance, it's still viable. And this, there's no question about that. Now, the issue with that, the limitation, is that you cannot tell whether myocardium that does not enhance is hibernating versus remodel simply because there are other reasons for cardiomyopathy in that particular individual. So myopathic ventricle and, uh, and hibernating myocardium will actually look similar. Uh, and so the question, uh, and, and this is why, you know, even when you go to the literature and you look at responses, contractile reserve responses, even when you have no enhancement whatsoever, it's still not a hundred percent improvement. And that means that, you know, there's always an element of non ischemic cardiomyopathy. And I think the issue is, you know, um, how do we differentiate that? So I guess I, told you, you know, what are the strengths and weaknesses when you look at the target and when you look at what each method does. And then there's one more element, which I think is where I think the radionuclide methods have an advantage, which is stress testing. And stress testing, you know, we keep talking about hibernation, but stress testing is just equally as important as defining whether there is hibernation or scar because it tells us about myocardium at risk, which is very important when you're trying to define whether a patient will improve following revascularization. And I think perfusion imaging with uh, a PET or even SPECT have this advantage that you can actually quantify very precisely the amount of petty infarct ischemia for example, which is more challenging for MRI because you already have scar. And yes, you can see uh, that the defect gets a little worse, but it's, it's not very quantitative. And I think quantification with perfusion imaging is a little more straightforward. And I think that part uh, has a little bit of an edge. So if I had only a question about, tell me what scarred myocardium, I think MRI probably is the winner because it's it's easy to do, right? With PET, you have to manipulate, you have to glucose load, you have to give insulin and all of that. And so, uh, so I, I think that's an issue. And many times we do both, you know, because we want sensitivity and specificity. Uh, but the other thing is that if the question is both viability and ischemia, my preference would be a PET scan uh, with uh, stress testing included, even though it's a little more complicated there. So long-winded answer, but I think 
there is room for all of the techniques. It really depends on the patient. Thank you, Marcelo. Excellent, Marcelo. Thank you for this fantastic explanation of the biology behind uh, the different modalities. This has been a great introduction to the role of myocardial viability testing in clinical practice with Dr. Marcelo De Carli. Don't miss part two of this episode where Dr. De Carli discusses what we've learned from the Stitch and Revive trial and where he provides unique insight into how we can use information from viability testing in guiding revascularization decision. Join us in part two of this interview. Okay.